Good morning and welcome. This is the webinar for the Associate Diploma in People Management and Associate Diploma in Organisational Learning and Development. Next slide, please. This is uh, to inform you about the assessment brief, which is for Core 5002, Evidence-Based Practice. And this assessment is for release in June 2024. Next slide, please. So just before we start, just a, a brief overview. The aim of this webinar is to provide you with practical advice and guidance on completing the evidence-based practice assessment. Next slide, please. So the unit overview, the assessment considers the significance of capturing quantitative and qualitative evidence to inform meaningful insight into people practice activity. It focuses on analysing evidence through a critical lens to improve decision making and how measuring the impact of people practice is essential in creating value. Next slide, please. So in the assessment brief, you'll notice, uh, as in all the assessment briefs, that there is a, a, a page called CIPD Insights the CIPD insights provide links to the various fact sheets and guides uh, and are included to insist your understanding of the topics related to the assessment. Accessing these will give you a useful introduction to the areas that are applicable to this assessment. Most of these are very contemporary and are well worth a visit. And this is possibly the part you would use first to scaffold your knowledge and understanding of the subject. Next slide, please. So this part, I just want to talk about preparing for assessment. Uh, and this is always probably the hardest part for most learners. Uh, so getting started. So my advice would be to start with reading the assessment brief. Uh, sometimes you probably need to do this a few times uh, to gain full understanding. And this outlines precisely what you're expected to do. Uh, you really need to get a clear understanding of the assessment requirements before you actually start to do anything. And it's amazing if you leave something and go back to it, you will find or see something different. So read it a few times, get very familiar with the assessment brief, and then you can start bringing the information together. It's also useful to read and familiarise yourself with the unit specification. Uh, these are available online or you can ask your tutor or facilitator for the unit specification, as this will explain the content in more detail. The parts to look for is underneath each of the assessment unit assessment criteria, you will see the indicative content. This is a guide, basically, and will detail the learning content that's required to capture each of the ACs. It's not an absolute, it's a guide, but certainly it will give you some sort of uh, approach to actually taking understanding what's within the ACs. It's useful if you're unsure of anything at this stage and you need further clarification to go to your facilitator or tutor to ask clarity. So the assessment will cover all 10 assessment criteria for the unit. So read these carefully, paying attention to the requirements of the command verbs. This is a level five qualification. So the command verbs will be pitched at a higher level for some parts of the assessment. Uh, so for each of the ACs for this unit assessment, the command verbs will be such as evaluate, explain, assess, appraise, interpret, present and recommend. And obviously some of these where you have to evaluate, assess and appraise are a higher level than an explanation. So pay careful attention to that because what you're trying to do is really compare and contrast or highlight strengths and limitations or weaknesses of what you're actually talking about. Next slide, please. So preparing for the assessment, 
Now we're going into the review of the relevant resources. So for the level five assessments, you'll need to relate some parts of your work to academic concepts, theories and professional practice throughout the assessment to ensure that your work is critical, evidence based and substantiated by key academic writers, researchers, text, articles and relevant publications. The wider you actually search for this, the higher quality your answer will be. And remember, all cited references used should be taken from credible sources and be correctly acknowledged and presented in the bibliography at the end of your report. Next slide, please. So continuing on with this, uh, before you start the assessment, as I've already noted, it's important that your subject knowledge and understanding is, is proficient on the subjects that you're talking about or the subject matters you're talking about. Start with the learning resources section in the unit specification, as this has been written and will point to the key textbooks, journals, online resources and web websites that relate to this unit. Useful resources for this would include obviously the CIPD insights, which we talked about, uh, survey reports, fact sheets, podcasts from key people writing and researching the subject matter uh, and indicative textbooks. Useful indicative textbooks will give you the coverage of key areas. And because the, 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 subject is, the subject matter is quite broad, you might have to go across a few textbooks to get specific areas, um, which will give you depth of inquiry into that particular area. And just finally on this bit, be mindful when using web-based content that it comes from trusted sources. Uh, some of the uh, sources on the uh, web are a bit dubious and therefore not correct. Ideally, you should go to key theorists or key academics that are actually writing around this subject. Next slide, please. So we're now going into the assessment and you'll see the in introduction is, is a scenario which sets the scene of the assessment. So for this assessment, your manager has asked you to complete a briefing paper for her to give a visiting team a pre people practice graduates who are particularly interested in how evidence-based practice is used in the context of people practices. The content needs to give them critical insight into what evidence-based practice is and how it is relevant to people professionals. She has also asked you to include practical examples of the type of data analysis that people professional use. So there's some key areas that we need to discuss there in terms of capturing the evidence that uh, is required for this scenario. Next slide, please. So the assessment requires the learner to prepare a briefing paper for people practice graduates. That's the audience that you're actually living to. Generally, a briefing paper provides background on pieces of information, so there's no prescribed format of how you present this. Probably it's useful to catch uh, the spirit of the assessment in, in the introductions, but the importance is that you capture all the assessment criteria that's required for this assessment. And this assessment is in two sections, which is in one linear form. Section one, which has a recommended word count of 2,900 and covers ACs 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 3.1 and 3.2. Section 2, which is a recommended word count of 1,000 words and covers the ACs 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3. Next slide, please. So for part one. Part one, you'll need to provide the graduates with knowledge and understanding of what evidence-based practice is. You also need to identify the approaches that can be taken in effective critical thinking and decision-making, ensuring that integrity and value is upheld, particularly by the people uh, practice department. You should also relate to academic concepts and theories and practical uh, 
people practice throughout your briefing paper to ensure that you were critically informed by using key text articles and relevant publications. And as I've already mentioned, all cited restaurants should be taken from some credible sources and be correctly acknowledged in text and presented in your bibliography at the end of your work. Uh, it's, you don't necessarily need to do Harvard Convention uh, so long as it's it, it's inside text correctly and acknowledged in the bibliography, that's fine. Next slide, please. So this now takes us into the main body of the assessment, which is the coverage of each individual AC. So we'll start obviously with AC 1.1, which requires you to evaluate the concept of evidence-based practice, including how approaches to evidence-based practice can be used to provide insight that supports sound decision-making across a range of people practices and organizational issues. So for, this, for coverage of this AC, you're really required to evaluate or determine the significance of the concept of evidence-based practice. As this requires evaluation, you need to support your responses with examples available in the relevant academic literature. And my advice would be to search evidence-based practice, particularly in some of the textbooks, because there's key writers in this particular area that provide useful models or useful concepts that you will be able to scaffold your explanation on in terms of how critical these are or otherwise. You will also need to include how evidence-based practice approaches can facilitate objective awareness for sound decision-making on people and business practices. And I think this is very important that essentially the data that is being used and how well you scrutinize data and approaches of evidence uh, will give you clear, integral understanding before you make a decision. Next slide, please. So AC 1.2, here you are required to evaluate one appropriate analysis tool and one appropriate analysis method that might be applied by organisations to recognise and diagnose current and future issues, challenges, and opportunities. So against this AC, uh, you're required to provide evaluation. Again, it's a higher command, so it, you've got to determine the significance of one analysis tool. And for example, this could be tools used for environmental scanning, such as steeple, pestle, uh, Porter's five forces model, force field analysis, uh, ANSOF, fishbone, uh, et cetera and one method such as interviews, observations, job analysis, questionnaires uh, that are, you use day to day in people practice. You then need to include how your chosen tool and method can be applied in organisational context to diagnose organisational issues, challenges and opportunities. That is really what are the strengths and what are the limitations of these models or the models that you've actually choosing? Next slide, please. This is AC 1.3, and here you need to explain the main principles of critical thinking, including how these might apply to your own and others' ideas to assist objective and rational debate. Here, you are required to explain the main elements of critical thinking. So you need to understand what critical thinking is and what that what elevates critical thinking from ordinary thinking and how these might apply to your own and others ideas to ensure objective evaluation of problems to make informed judgments before you actually approach a, a decision. Next slide, please. So AC 1.4, for this AC, you need to explain two decision-making processes for achieving effective outcomes. Here you're required to explain two decision-making processes. And for example, there's quite a lot you could go at this, but you could draw upon Edward de Bono's lateral thinking, action learning groups, 
Pareto's analysis, SWOT, etc. You then need to describe how uh, your chosen processes are applied in context to ensure effective outcomes are achieved. So that's within the, the, the world of people practice or your own uh, practice. Next slide, please. AC 1.5 assess two different ethical perspectives uh, can be used to inform and influence moral decision making. Here, you're required to assess, again, make an informed ju judgment, how two different ethical perspectives, uh, for example, uh, utilitarianism, deontology, Kantian rights based ethics, etc. There's quite a few to go at. Uh, can be used to promote and influ influence fairness, honesty and inclusivity in decision making. So how do these uh, philosophical assumptions uh, from the ethics world inform or guide us to make fairness, honest and inclusive decision making? Next slide, please. AC 3.1. Uh, for the a praise two different organizational measures, uh, financial and non-financial performance, and provide one example of each. So for this AC, you're required to appraise the value and quality of one financial measure, such as return of investment, gross and net profit, etc., and one non-financial example example. For this, you might consider service level agreements, balance scorecards, customer satisfaction example, etc. Both responses require practical examples of how these are used within the uh, people practice. Next slide, please. Uh, this is AC 3.2. Here you need to explain how people practices add value in an organization, identify two methods that might be used to measure the impact of people practices. So for this AC, you are required to explain how people practices create value for the organization. And I think this is one that sometimes uh, gets lost a little bit. Uh, people practice, uh, it's that link, the causal link between the people practice and the business that's important in this. So how you as a people practitioner actually create value to the business. In explaining value creation, you might consider, there's a whole raft of things you could consider here, but look at your HR people practice activities, such as careful selection and hiring of employees, talent acquisition, carefully designed induction and socialization processes, ensuring visible processes are in place to ensure decision making and job autonomy, facilitating voice, information sharing, developing employees and rewarding performance, etc. Uh, there's, there's a lot more that you could go at though, but so it's really looking at how you support people practice in terms of aligning that and add value to the business. Uh, the response also needs to highlight the impact of your choices, such as short term, positive, negative uh, aspects. Um, and you could ident identification of two methods, such as cost, best cost benefit analysis, return of investment, return of equity, staff surveys, HR metrics that you use, benchmarking, both internally and externally, and goal-based evaluation, et cetera. Next slide, please. So now we come into part two. So part two is uh, really how we look at data and how we illuminate data to show the, the value that people practitioners do towards the organization in supporting the business. So here we've got a briefing paper and you need to use the information that's provided in table one and table two and provide examples of the tape type of data analysis that people practice it, practitioners use. Please note that these two, uh, certainly AC 1.1 and 2.2 do not require any references as their practical tasks. So I want to just start with table one. 
Table one provides performance judgments for employees from four departments across two quarters of the year. Each individual employee's performance outcome is in indicated by one of four criteria based judgments uh, as listed below. The four are outstanding, meets set individual key performance indicators, not quite there yet and underperforming. Next slide, please. So we're covering now AC 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3 uh, which are with reference to people practice issue, interpret analytical data using the appropriate analytical tools and methods, present key findings for stakeholders from people practice activities and initiatives, and make justifiable recommendations based on evaluations of the benefits, risk and financial implications of the potential solutions. So continuing with table one data for this, uh, the, basically you need to present each department's performance judgment as a percentage. Very simple, just convert them as a percentage because it's easier to actually list percentage outcomes than it, do, it is in raw data. So just simply convert, convert them into a percentage and that will then give you the patterns that you need to do to talk about. So those gaining outstanding are entitled to a 4% bonus payment each quarter. What you need to do is calculate the bonus due to each of these employees for the quarter and then provide an overall total cost of the bonus payments for the organisation and then present your findings use a minimum of three appropriate diagrammatical forms and make justifiable recommendations based on your recommendation uh, on, on your evaluations i mean the forms normally are uh, are used uh, as simple bar charts or pie charts but you can use the other ones so long as they illuminate the data uh, for the end user next slide please so table two data, uh, sorry, on table one data, you see that that, that is basically uh, quantifiable data. For table two data, what we're asking you to do is look at some qualitative data. Now, qualitative data tends to give us themes and patterns because it's often written uh, and we pick up. There is uh, tools that we can use to actually pick up keywords that allow us to actually uh, uh, it, it search for patterns within the data, but for this, it's quite a simple task. Again, I'm just reiterating, this is coverage of 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3. For table two data, what you've been given here is uh, data has been collected from managers, employees uh, on their views of the organization's approach to monitoring performance. What you need to do is review the data uh, again, it, it, you'll see there's there's a certain amount of patterns uh, that are very, you know, and themes that are going to be seen into this data. It's useful, again, to, to convert this from uh, numbers into percentage form, because when you're writing it up, you can use terms like uh, just over 60% uh, uh, thought this, or so it's easier to actually write it in the written word when you're doing your recommendations. Uh, so... Yeah, what you need to do really is, is identify any patterns, themes or trends before presenting recommendations on your findings. Next slide, please. So responding to the ACs, um, once you've done this, obviously you, you'll submit your assessment for marking and your assessor will mark your work against each of the assessment criteria. So a key uh, point there, it's useful to highlight or signpost coverage of the ACs because it makes it easy for the assessor or marker to actually see where the evidence is captured for that particular AC. Uh, once it's been marked, this will indicate where your work sits within the marking band range. So depending on the quality of answer, uh, you'll be marked from one to four uh, and these will be ordered for each assessment criteria within the unit. Obviously, um, anything that falls within the one is a fail because this doesn't demonstrate sufficient knowledge, understanding the skill as appropriate to meet the AC. Uh, the pass range is two, three and four. 
mark of two across all the ACs will give you a low pass. And this demonstrates exceptional knowledge, understanding or skill as appropriate to meet the AC. A three is a pass. And this demonstrates good level of knowledge, understanding or skill as appropriate to meet the AC. And finally, a four will give a high pass, which demonstrates wide and confident level knowledge, understanding and skill to meet the AC. I mean, generally, uh, acceptable knowledge is you're just doing salient coverage of the AC requirements. A pass, you're starting to bring in some uh, knowledge and, uh, and understanding and some criticality to the requirements of the work. And a high pass, obviously, wide and confident criticality and, and knowledge and understanding. Uh, it's worth, at this point, noting that uh, if you do not on on the the ACs that require uh, uh, support from uh, theory and knowledge outside the work, then you will not achieve a low pass. You'll achieve a fail because it would be too descriptive. It has to have uh, support from outside theory and, and and understanding. Next slide, please. So finally. What I need to just remind you of before you start in this is ensure that you remain when you've written the work that you remain compliant with the CIPD word count policy. You can access this on the hub, uh, but make sure that you work within the requirements of this because otherwise it will be a fail. Uh, before submitting your assessment, it's useful to get it proofread to check for mistakes and typographical errors. Uh, if you're including reference, uh, you must uh, use theorists, models, academic literature or case study examples. You must include them in the bibliography and in text referencing. Uh, so just finally, I hope this webinar has provided you with necessary support and guidance in preparing and completing your assessment. And all that remains is I wish you good luck and, and hope you enjoy this assessment. Thank you.